Stephen Blaine, your host with White Labs, an e-commerce marketing agency. Today's guest is Chris. Chris, feel free to introduce yourself and let our viewers know a little bit more about yourself and your background. Yeah, sure. Hi, Stephen. Uh, this is Chris Carter. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Gulu Made. Uh, it's uh, Gulu Made is um, we make backpacks. So uh, I, I brought some show and tell. This is our our original backpack that we made. Uh, we launched around beginning of. 2020, which you can imagine was not a great time uh, to be launching into the backpack business. Uh, it's interestingly a good time to be in e-commerce, but not a good time to be making products for going places. So that, uh, uh, but there's a lot of ba- a lot of backstory, which I'm sure we'll get to uh, into, into why I was launching this particular company. So. Awesome. Well, tell me more about the brand. Tell me about Google. Tell me, tell me, tell me the whole story. Sure, sure. So. Uh, I'm going to start back a few years, um, uh, and and prior to me launching this company, I actually um, am a lawyer by training. Graduated from Harvard Law School, practiced law for many years, um, hated every second of it, uh, and uh, I mean, I look back on it fondly now, to be quite honest. But while I was doing it, I, I was pretty miserable, and I really, really wanted to be an entrepreneur. I mean, that was I actually represented a lot of entrepreneurs, um, and so I was really excited about that. Uh, and uh, fast forward a few years, I ended up launching a tech company. Uh, it didn't ever really do great, uh, but it, it did okay. Um, it was in the music space. You can probably tell from my what's behind me. I'm also a musician. Um, so uh, through all of that, I ended up working at Gibson Guitar for a few years, running their technology division, and uh, but really wanted to get back into the entrepreneurial space. But another thing happened along the way, which is I took a trip to Africa on on sort of a trip to basically go build a school in Rwanda. Uh, this was many years ago, probably 15 years ago, but it really kind of opened my eyes to the reality of sort of daily life for people that live very differently than the way I live in Washington, D.C. And so I started a tech nonprofit. That was so my, my next entrepreneurial journey was actually into the nonprofit space. Uh, but really, in, in all of that years of journey, I just decided that I wanted to create jobs in Africa. That was kind of my my goal for um, what I wanted to do with my life. And so, uh, fast forward a few years, weirdly, I got to know this nun by the name of sister Rosemary in Northern Uganda. Um, the reason I got to know her is my daughter did a gap year living with, uh, this group of nuns. We're not even Catholic, but it was just kind of interesting that my daughter was living there when she was 18. So I got to know this nun very well. And one of the things that made Sister Rosemary somewhat famous in this region of the world, actually, she's pretty famous in the U.S., is because she had created a sewing academy um, for girls who uh, uh, that, you know, had had lack of employment opportunities. Uh, this was also after a long civil war and some really tough things that happened in the region. But uh, one of the things I learned in talking to Sister Rosemary is that they just didn't have employment for these women afterwards. So they would train them to sew in this school, but they didn't really have employment. So she and I started talking, brainstorming. Um, and essentially, I wrote the business plan, built the business model, sourced materials for making a backpack business, thinking I was handing it over to Uganda nuns. And it turns out that Uganda nuns probably aren't the best people to run businesses. They were not very, they were excited about the idea of it. They were not excited about what all the work that goes into it. So basically, I backed into becoming an entrepreneur in this particular case um, because I had set everything up and now I was like, Oh, I guess I'm going to have to run this business. So that's essentially how Gulu got launched, uh, in, in Northern Uganda initially to, uh, essentially to create jobs. But my business was all, my business idea was always don't just make, you know, a, a nice nonprofit type product that people can buy out of sympathy, make a really, really well-designed high end product that will sell in the United States. And that's, so we really, we focused our energies on on design and on uh, really really going after uh, high end materials uh, for our products, products so that so our backpacks can can really compete with anybody. Awesome! What a, that's a that's a great story. I like it. So, who is your target audience for the products? Yeah, we really have two, um, and I know this is focused on e commerce. So I'll I'll mention in the e commerce space, I would say our target audience would be you know. Uh, I, it's hard to use millennials as a term because that that crowd keeps moving in age. But basically, the 25 to 45 year old demographic would sort of be our sweet spot. 
sort of an urban demographic. Uh, mm-hmm. We aren't, we don't make backpacks for hiking and that sort of thing. We really make everyday carry laptop bags um, that are just sort of uh, that that centerpiece of your life that you you sometimes pay attention to, but you may not realize how important it is uh, because it sort of carries everything that you go into your day when you're in a office or in school or in a coffee shop, wherever it is that you happen to be, um, your, your backpack or your bag is kind of that, that central tool that you need. And so that's the, that's how we design our products is to be that, that central go everywhere with you tool. Awesome. Well, you touched on it briefly, but what makes you different or better than your competitors out there? You have a lot of them. There's a lot. Yeah. It was, uh, um, maybe not the, the greatest idea to go into such a crowded space, but, uh, we've been, we've been, fortunate that i think we have i mean obviously where our products are made is unique um and that's that's uh, a big part of our story as well because we want that's not just for our sake that's actually for the sake of our customers right we want our customers to engage with our product in recognition that when they buy a gulu made product they know that they're carrying something that actually helped uh, employ a woman in Uganda and help that woman send her children to school and help that woman, you know, feed her family. So we, we think that that's a, and, and we hear that all the time from our customers that they really love that, that sort of direct connection between their own purchase decision and uh, the impact that it has. Uh, so, so that's, that's probably the thing that clearly makes us most unique. Um, I like to point out, you know, particular features of our bags, um, that that are unique but but if i'm honest other bags have other features that are unique too so um, it's it's kind of a if it's just a feature war you know within within products we just sit alongside a bunch of others Uh, but i think what makes us unique is the ability to attach to the story of the makers um, who actually make it whereas i think most most companies you know i don't want to badmouth anybody but most companies kind of treat their supply chain as a, an invisible thing that's not really meant to be looked at um at best they might say oh yeah we checked and made sure that there's no forced labor or there's no child yeah. labor um but it's more just kind of something that they do um after you know after the fact and i understand why they do that we started our business really at the opposite end of that spectrum we started at the beginning of the supply chain and said we're going to focus on that and we're going to shine light on it. So, you know, you see pictures on our website of the women that actually make our bags. Um, and we think that's, you know, that's, that's just who we are. Whether that translates to being unique in the marketplace, that's really for the market to decide at the end of the day. I think it definitely makes you unique. What are your best selling products? Uh, our backpacks are definitely the best selling. We have another one, uh, one other one that, that, uh, is the first one that actually sold out initially, which is uh, we call it our change maker sling, which is a um, it's a sling that's actually large enough to hold a 13 inch laptop. So, awesome. Um, so you could carry it as a laptop bag, but it's it's a lot smaller and it's just a great little go. It's the one I carry around town all the time, uh, and uh, it, it tends to be uh, tends to be the highest. Uh, uh, the highest seller. Uh, one of the second highest sellers is our tech pack. Our tech pack is just a little, um, uh, a little uh, pouch that holds all of your tech gear, uh, you know, cords and you know all that kind of stuff, and you know, chargers and things. And so um, that's a really big seller. But at the end of the day, our backpack lines, you know, we have three or four different backpacks that are uh, that are really the biggest, the biggest sellers. Awesome, that's great. What um, what is the future plan for yourself and the brand? Uh, funny you should ask. That's a, that's actually a more complex question than you may realize. Um, I mentioned that we're based in Northern Uganda. One of the things that's unique about us is because we ship all of our product to the United States. Um, and because we want to have a really low carbon footprint, um, we intentionally ship everything by water, uh, meaning, you know, sea freight, which is slow. Uh, there is the option uh, in Africa of just putting things on planes. Uh, sometimes it's even cheaper to put it on planes. Um, because of the speed and and cost, uh, we we really insist on shipping everything by water. What that means, though, is Uganda. If you look at a map, Uganda is landlocked, so Uganda's here, Kenya's next to it, um, and so we go to the port in Kenya, which means that our overland costs of shipping are shockingly high um, to get our product out of Uganda to the United States. Uh, so much so that it was really kind of breaking our business model. So we've set up a new factory. 
um, in Ethiopia that we literally are going online this week um, and uh, in a little town called Butajira, Ethiopia. And so that that uh, factory is coming online, our new products. Uh, I have uh, an entirely new design, bag design that's coming um, right. that uh, that's part of this part of this new line. Um, okay. you, you might be able to tell that the brand name is also changing. So okay. uh, we, we will be launching a new brand called Thrive, T-H-R-I-I-V. And we'll, we'll keep the Gulu made brand in Uganda. And basically what the team in Uganda is going to continue doing is making product for the African market. So they will basically make product and sell within Uganda, Kenya, Ethiopia. Um, but all of our export is going to be done out of our new factory in Ethiopia. Awesome. So you started the brand in 2020. What are, yeah. I'm sure, and I'm sure you have a lot. Being an entrepreneur, what are some challenges that you face and how are you able to overcome them? Oh boy. It's, besides, it's, besides, it's, COVID, besides COVID. <laughs> yeah, besides COVID. No, I, yeah. I mean, it's a, the, the part that I'm, you're hearing me groan about is a lot of those challenge, I'm, challenges I'm not sure we ever actually successfully overcame. Um, so, you know, one is just probably the biggest challenge for a small brand like ours is just pushing through the noise of e-commerce, right? There's a there's a lot of noise out there. Um, and as you already noted, you know, we're already in a highly competitive space, right? I mean, it's not like I invented some, you know, unique little thing that I can just do a, a TikTok video about and everybody will be like, I got to have that thing, right? Uh, you know, what I'm what I am producing and manufacturing is a product that everybody's familiar with. They've already seen all types, all, you know, so the likelihood of me coming up with a backpack that is so unique that it's going to push through the noise in an e-commerce space is is unlikely. Um, so that's been our biggest challenge. And to be honest, I don't know that we overcome it. One of the ways that we overcame it was sort of doing an in run which is, uh, I know this is about e-commerce, but actually our biggest business has actually been in the corporate space. So we actually sell to a lot of companies who make their employee back, we make their employee backpacks for them and put their corporate logo on them. So just as an example, you might be familiar with uh, the largest concert company in the world is called Live Nation. So yes. Live Nation's employees all use our backpacks. Uh, and one of the things that that we found in that space that that overcame a problem we had in the e-commerce space was that that the the uniqueness of our story really held a lot of value for a, a corporate entity like Live Nation. Um, they really valued as part of their corporate social responsibility the the ability to both buy a product that also had a direct impact in Uganda and East Africa. And so uh, so that was one of the ways we we pushed through that particular challenge. Uh, but we're still working to, uh, to, you know, navigate that. And as we relaunch with a new brand under Thrive, we'll be we'll be trying to to do that again through a new Kickstarter that we'll be launching in a couple of months, trying to push through the noise. But at the end of the day, the noise in the e-commerce space is probably the biggest challenge that we have. Hundred um, percent. What you you kind of just touched on it though. What what is what's been the most successful activity to to promote the brand? In our case, actually, it's been PR more than anything. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so and I, I because that, yeah. I think it's because you know the typical ad model, whether it's you know uh, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, the typical ad model, um, the ads are short. Our story is longer and a bit more complex. What makes us unique is a bit more complex. So from an ad perspective, we kind of just look like another backpack uh -huh. uh, popping through your feed. Um, so so we have found sort of doing end runs that way. Certainly working with affiliates has been uh, better because affiliates who can affiliates have a little bit longer time to speak to the story. And, and as a story based brand, we, we need that time. So those have, those have been probably the you know PR and affiliates, what I say, would, would definitely have been more successful than straight online advertising. Awesome. What advice would you give someone in 2024 that's looking to start an e-commerce brand? Um, <laughs> well, uh, this isn't very useful advice because I don't think anybody would do this anyway. But my, my first advice is don't start an e-commerce brand where you're also the manufacturer mm -hmm. and where you're manufacturing in East Africa. It's an insane amount of, of complexity to do all of those things at the same time. Now, I don't know. Hardly anybody's going to do that. So yeah. 
What I would say, though, that's relevant, that's I think relevant for most people, is um, don't start a brand that you can't focus in on exactly what the factors of success are. In, in my case, I've had to focus on like five factors and you need to, I believe you need to have a much more narrow focus. And if I pull off these two or three things, I will be able to make my business successful. And, you know, that, that's been, that's learning I would, I would pass on to any entrepreneur is don't start with this broad a range of issues. I mean, I have to navigate purchasing fabric or purchasing foam or purchasing zippers in, you know, Uganda and Ethiopia. That's not a thing that a normal, you know, online commerce, e-commerce business owner has to navigate. Narrow focus would be probably the my big advice. I think that's amazing advice. <laughs> Chris, is there anything that I haven't asked you that you'd want our listeners to know about yourself and well, the, the brand and the new brand? Um, yeah, I think we've covered most of it. I mean, I just I I would encourage people to uh, uh, watch for. Uh, the Thrive Kickstarter, which will be coming in just a couple months. I mean, I'm I'm literally showing you the prototype before anybody's ever seen it. So uh, this is a prototype of our new bag. Uh, I, it's hot off the hot off the presses. Just uh, arrived in, in on my porch a few days ago. Awesome. Um, and so we'll be we'll be launching that on Kickstarter and launching the new brand. So would love for people to uh, to watch out for that. If you're interested uh, at all. Just go to info at gulumade.com, email there, uh, join the email list at, at gulumade.com, and uh, you'll, be, you'll, you'll be included on all the info that's coming about Thrive. But that, these new bags will be coming online. We, we think we'll even have these bags in the U.S. probably in the next uh, four to six months. So. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Chris, and uh, enjoyed your story. Thank you. Appreciate it, Stephen. Thank you. Definitely.